uh, for my partner Jennifer Hayes and myself. It's a real honor to be here at Yale. Truly is. I, I am a photographer. Jennifer is the scientist in our family. And uh, I am basically forbidden to talk a lot about science, but I will be talking a lot about art and photography. Uh, for sharks have run through our lives back and forth and all the work we've done throughout the oceans. They seem to be a, literally a backbone, uh, a backbone without cartilage, but nevertheless a backbone to our work. I've been shooting, and Jennifer's been shooting, we've been shooting a long time for Geographic. Jennifer jokes that one of my earlier stories, uh, Plesiosaurs of the New Jersey Coast, um, was a relatively minor hit. There was also stories called Consider the Sponge and other things. But sharks <laughs> are, well, Consider the Sponge wasn't a very good story either, but sharks are really, in many, in many ways, a symbol of the ocean. Exceptionally mysterious, powerful, unknown, frighteningly frightening, and of course, beautiful. They run through human psyche and run through our lives. From everything from this tiny little swell shark in Izu, Japan, this is the embryo, to an absolutely giant uh, devil shark, or actually lantern shark, coming up from about uh, 4,000 feet in Suruga Bay on the other side of the Izu Peninsula. You can see its green eye searching for deep sea prey to large things like a whale shark. This is a picture made off the Ningaloo Reef in uh, Western Australia near the town of Exmouth. And because of pictures like this, uh, there has been a uh, institution where people are going out to see sharks. And this group of whale sharks, even though they're transitory, are protected. Large things and large things in trouble. A basking shark in the village of Nakiri in Japan. Its fins have come off, very valuable. The rest of the shark was rendered down to be used for things like lipstick and Shiseido cosmetics. And a picture I made a long time ago, a young boy fishing tiger sharks off Isla Mujeres in Mexico. There's something about sharks and the relationship with humans that are very, not necessarily abstract, but surreal. But for ourselves and all our underwater photographer colleagues, underwater photography really is a language. It's a language that's universal, and what it does we hope, in the best situations, is the hardest job in communication, which is convincing the unconvinced. From South Africa, ragged tooth sharks. And here's a story that Jennifer and I did with Peter Benchley. This is one of the most popular covers in geographic history. And as you can see, geographic goes not just in the United States, but all throughout the world. This is, uh, I believe this is, uh, this, this is the Spanish edition. There's also a Portuguese edition and a Croatian edition. It reaches about 40 million people throughout the world. This particular, this particular picture from South Africa changed the way an entire community, the community of Hans Bai, did business and developed, developed a shark, white shark tourism business which uh, created hundreds, maybe thousands of jobs and led to the protection of great white sharks in South Africa. Our favorite place, it's a tiny island at the entrance to the Spencer Gulf in South Australia. Are we, are we, if, okay, how about this? Is this better? 
Sorry. And this is, this is a terrific place. It's like, uh, these are Australian sea lions, and they are equivalent of the golden retrievers of pinnipeds. They're gentle and wonderful. If you've ever worked with pinnipeds or dove with them, for instance, in California, the California sea lions uh, act like psychotic torpedoes. <laughs> but uh, these guys, these wonderful guys will tickle your hands with their whiskers, they'll bite the strobe cords, and they will look deeply into your eyes. <laughs> so, Jennifer and I are diving with these guys, and they're looking deeply into our eyes. And then all of a sudden, in this lovely, shallow, clear um, uh, bed of uh, seagrasses, the richest seagrasses in the world are in South Australia, all of a sudden, they're gone. They've all gone back to land, and they know something that we don't know. And what they know is that this is what's coming around the corner. <laughs> it's a picture we worked uh, on quite a while from uh, South Australia to South Africa, looking down the throat of the great white shark, working on this story with Peter Benchley. Uh, it's the ultimate end of somebody dealing with sharks. Uh, and it's not a good place to drop anything like, uh, like uh, your credit card or your wallet or your watch or anything, because you'll never get it back. And it was made by a pole camera. You don't take a camera, a uh, regular underwater camera, with your head and shoulders and stick it into a 14 or 15 foot long great white shark's mouth. It's not good. A pole camera puts the pole in there. You pull the camera out before the shark can bite down and pull you over the, over the side of the boat. And this is South Africa. This is Cape Point, where the sun is setting, the Atlantic, with little boat is going across along Cape Point, the Indian Ocean. Incredibly rich place with incredible amount of upwelling and an enormous amount of life, like Cape fur seals. There's possibly uh, uh, over two million of these guys, and they, they form uh, part of the diet for a very large population of great white sharks. And great white sharks are beautiful. Sculptural, magnificent, coursing just under the surface. Uh, the way you photograph them usually is in a cage. Uh, they come to you, you don't come to them, they're ghosts of the sea. This is a successful picture because our friend who's in the cage, um, who's a photographer from South, a uh, South Australia, is, uh, he's a terrific guy and he's the best shark model because he's about five foot one inches tall and everything seems to be huge around him. But the shark was large. <laughs> Andre Hartman, one of the people we work with, uh, who are one of the great shark people in the world. They're not, um, they're not uh, scientists. They are naturalists. And people like Andre and Rodney Fox and other people whose uh, uh, the spirit of the shark has basically inhabited them. The most important. Uh, most important uh, input and ingredient in successful underwater photography is the guide. They will show you things that you will never see in your life. And without them, no images. Andre here is swimming with the great white. He uses the spear gun simply to tap on that great white's nose to turn him back and forth. And the trick, he said, is to never swim with two great whites, because one will always be on your blind side. Guadalupe Island. Here is another place where the presence of great white sharks have attracted photographers, divers, and of course, that comes with money. Money is the key ingredient, I think, in conservation. When that happens, species get protected. We worked in Tasmania. 
this is Tasman Island. It's right next to Hobart on the approach to Hobart, uh, the capital of Tasmania on the uh, southeast corner of Tasmania, the heart-shaped island full of Tasmanian devils, which incidentally do not look like anything from Warner Brothers. Tasmanian devil looks like a dog called a skippergy that has uh, been beaten up and they howl. <laughs> Nevertheless, Tasman Island is an incredible place. Uh, you can see the um, lighthouse there. To give you an idea of the, um, the geography here and the geology, that lighthouse is 100 feet tall. They wanted to put a bed and breakfast there, but uh, they were afraid that the clients would wander off at night. <laughs> In the spring of the year, the saw sharks come up. And here's a saw shark just underneath the, uh, uh, the field of uh, green algae. And the elephant fish, uh, they will come up from the deep too. Uh, they will, uh, they will mate in the bays and shallow bays near Hobart. Uh, here's a picture of an elephant fish. I took this picture. It's one of the greatest and strangest creatures in the world, that link between sharks and bony fish. And I took a look at it again when I got back to the office. This is in the days of film when you would shoot and you'd shoot for months at a time and not see a single picture that you produced. Uh, digital photographers can't imagine what that's like these days. But I got back to the office and looked at this picture and said, my God, the thing looks exactly like Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> Franklin, Franklin. <laughs> we worked on the Great Barrier Reef. Extraordinary thing. I'm, you look at this picture. This is a place called Hook and Hardy Reef. They are platform reefs in the middle of the Great Barrier Reef system, 1,500 miles long. This is off Prosperin, Prosopine, sorry, Prosopine, about in the middle of the reef system. And if you hold out, you, well, you can't imagine this, but if you imagine the size of an infant's fingernail, that's, the, that's a coral polyp. And that produces this. It's a biological um, action that produces the most incredible geological facts on our planet. We were working on a story in the Barrier Reef two years ago. Uh, the reason, the impetus for working on the story, the reason for it is because of the changing uh, acidity in the ocean. And it will, it will threaten the reefs, the basic chemistry ocean, uh, the amount of CO2 will threaten the reefs. And scientists like Charlie Varon, who is one of the key great reef biologists in the world, have predicted that the Barrier Reef will all but disappear in the next 30 years. Not necessarily disappear, but will morph or change into something that we will not recognize. But we're working there, and we got a call from another underwater photographer saying there's a sperm whale that has drifted on to the northern part of the Barrier Reef near uh, uh, north of Cairns and was drifting slowly down the reef. We caught up with it, uh, we caught up with it slightly south. Uh, it had been gone for three or four days by the time we got there, and all that was left was this large chunk of this 45-foot-long sperm whale. Imagine something that's 60, 80, 100 years old, concentrating all this energy, and it was oozing oil, and it was surrounded by tiger sharks. The trick about photographing uh, tiger sharks eating sperm whales, or the rest of, or the remainder of a sperm whale, is never, ever get between the remainder of the sperm whale and the tiger shark. But again, there's, you know, there's a kind of a sculptural look to these creatures. They are absolutely magnificent, beautiful. They would crawl right up into the, into the whale and take enormous bites out of it. And the oil coming from the whale coated everything, coated us, coated the cameras, coated everything. Uh, and the sun went down and the, sh the tiger sharks began to, uh, the population began to increase and fairly soon the whale was gone. We also photographed on a place called Great Detached Reef. 
And Great Detached Reef is in the very northern end of the Great Barrier Reef, almost by the uh, almost by the tip of the Cape York Peninsula. It's a reef literally detached from uh, the rest of the Great Barrier Reef, and it is a healthy coral reef system. Scientists say that um, a healthy reef system means a healthy shark population. But in other cases, such as this place, this dreamlike place, it's a place called Wyag Island, and it's off the Bird's Head Peninsula on the very western end of the island of New Guinea. This is in Indonesia. It is the richest, uh, most densely active, biologically diverse uh, reef system in the world. And we dove there. We've been working there now for three, almost four years. We've seen only one carcharinid species, a shark, and this other one, a wobegon shark. This is, this is this place that's so rich and so incredibly dense in life. And this is the only shark we really saw sleeping in a 55-gallon uh, uh, oil drum left over from the war. There's other places that are also intensely beautiful. The Gardens of the Queens uh, archipelago off the southern uh, side of Cuba. It's a 70-mile long group of islands uh, fronting onto the fronting onto the deep water of the uh, Caribbean basin, and of course the flats, the, the flats and the mangroves of Cuba. Uh, the Cuban coast is 50 miles away. There's virtually no fishing, and we dove there, surrounded by silky sharks as evening came. And off North Carolina, there's an incredibly healthy population of sand tiger sharks that surround the shipwrecks. Some of them uh, were uh, left over from a, a German uh, uh, artificial reef program that was, uh, uh, began in 1942 and concluded in 1945. It was called World War II, and it dotted the bottom of, uh, off, uh, off Moorhead City, North Carolina, the reefs, uh, the, the wrecks are covered with clouds of bait fish, and surrounding the clouds of bait fish are large groups of sand tiger sharks, and sometimes in the winter it's been reported up to two or three hundred of the sand tiger sharks are gathering there. And here's a picture made in a very, very exotic location. These are blue sharks, elegant, thin, and strangely blue. And they were taken in this terribly exotic location called Block Island, which is not very far from here. We photographed there, and then a month and a half later, This is a mako shark, also in the same population. A month and a half later, we were in Vigo, Spain, uh, the, uh, the largest fishing port for all of Europe. For every swordfish caught on a swordfish boat, for, okay, I'm going to do three more minutes. For, <laughs> For every swordfish caught on a swordfish boat, uh, at least 10 to 12 blue sharks were caught too, also on a long line. The swordfish boats operate right up to the coast of, uh, right up to our 200 mile limit across the entire Atlantic. Every swordfish, 10 or 12 blue sharks. Blue sharks are worth about two and a half euros a pound. Mako sharks are the most expensive, more expensive than swordfish. Makos.
And of course, what comes off first are the fins. We dive in the Bahamas. We pay a lot of money to go out to the Bahama banks and photograph tiger sharks. Many other people do. And I think this is one of the good news stories about what's going on. We've been talking about the Cook Islands and Tahiti and across the Pacific and the Bahamas. They are shark sanctuaries now. Stewart Cove feeds groups of Caribbean reef sharks. Thousands of people come there. This is the birth of a lemon shark. And we went in the water on a stormy night facing the Florida, uh, facing the uh, uh, Gulf Stream, looking towards Florida on the edge of the Bahama Banks. These are lemon sharks. Elegant, beautiful, and something that we need to preserve. Thank you.